Organization of Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Fever has a tight grip here. It has indeed, sir. If you're ready, sir. Keep back. Give us room. Inspect the bucket, sir. Don't touch any of them, sir. been staying here, sir. She says he went off two days ago, off on a tramp. <laughs> Did he go alone? No, sir. We went with two women. From the Brickfields, she says. What Brickfields? You hear? The Brickfields. Where? Stolben's Brickfields. Stolben. Where? Come on, where? All right, Darby. Leave her. St. Albans, sir. County of Hertfordshire. Famous this time for its brickmaking business. A little in the doldrums of late. On the tramp for work. <laughs> These two women have gone back home and they've taken the boy with them. For what reason remains to be seen. It means the boy is out of London, Mr. Tulkinghorn. I want him to hold his tongue. I want him to know that he must. He needs a warning, Mr. Bucket. He can't be allowed to gossip about my affairs, however insignificant a part of my affairs. He must not meddle. I hope you can see to it, Inspector. Darby. Sir. Light the way here. Sir. Troublesome, these small matters. But the law must guard itself against impertinence. With you all the way, sir. Crook, it's time. It's the appointed time, Crook. Time to do business. Time for the letters, Crook. Letters. Are you there, Crook?
Mr. Mann, gentlemen of the jury, proved to be in the habit of consuming spiritous liquors in exceptionally large quantities. <laughs> a man of advanced years and doubtful health and very secretive about his circumstances, even to the point of shunning his neighbours in the matters of their inquiries as to his well-being. The deceased, in short, was in a state of mind only to be guessed at, which is of little assistance to this inquest, except insofar as the witness, Mr. William Guppy, who lodges at the house, offered the observation that, in his opinion, the deceased crook appeared to be more active in his business concerns of late, although uh, the witness, Mr. Guppy, was unable to say in what particular. So, members of the jury, we have no reason for supposing that the deceased crook had decided to consign his business and his life to the flames. And as to an accidental verdict, the medical evidence questions how he could accidentally come to burn himself all through. <laughs> Learning medical evidence divides yes and no on the proposition of spontaneous combustion by which the deceased was set on fire from within without the assistance of external fuel. Now here is a mystery that we cannot account for. And if you find the deceased died by misadventure unknown, then that is how you should so return. Gentlemen of the jury, consider your verdict. I've come to look after the property. Crook was my wife's brother. He had no other relations but her. We shall make good our title. It's in the hands of my solicitor. Do the shake me up. Shake me up, you poor parrot. It's my property. Transportation for the gallows for anybody who touches a property. My property. My property. To beg your ladyship's pardon, I've called at an inconvenient time. Uh, if you would wish me to call on another occasion, I... What have you come to tell me? The fact is, your ladyship, I... I haven't brought the letters. I won't be able to bring them. The person I was to have had them from There was a fire, Your Ladyship. That is all you have to say? You had better be sure, because this is the last time you will be given the opportunity. Oh, that's all, Your Ladyship. Except I, I regret any inconvenience or uh, disturbance my previous visit might unnecessarily have caused. Then good evening to if you. If you don't mind, Your Ladyship, I, uh, I would prefer to see myself out. I beg your pardon, Lady Dedlock, a thousand times. It is so very unusual to find you here at this hour. I thought the room was empty. I do beg your pardon. Please stay, Mr. Tulkinghorn. I'm going out to dinner. I have nothing further to say to this young man. Congratulated, Mr. Guppy. You're a fortunate young man. Oh, 
But I'm complaining, Mr. Tulkinghorn. Complain? High friends, free admission to great houses, access to elegant ladies. Mr. Guppy, there are people in London who would give their ears to be you. If I attend to my profession, sir, and do what is right by my employers, Kenji and Carboys, my friends and acquaintances are of no consequence to them. Nor any other member of the legal profession, not excepting yourself, sir. I'm under no obligation to explain myself further. And with all respect for you, sir, and without offence, I repeat, without offence, I do not intend to do it. Quite so. Very good. Well, Sergeant, uh, George, isn't it? Well, sir. Well, George, what do you say? You don't mind, sir. I'd like to know what you say. Do you mean in terms of reward? In terms of everything, sir. I thought Mr. Smallweed had sufficiently explained the matter. It's simple enough. You uh, served under Captain Horton, didn't you? And were rather in his confidence, I think. I served many years with the captain, sir. Therefore, you may happen to have in your possession something in his handwriting. A letter, an order, accounts, uh, anything will do. Whatever you have, I wish to compare the writing with something I have. Uh, you shall be rewarded for your trouble. Three, four, five guineas, you would consider that handsome, wouldn't you? Will you tell me why you want to compare his writing? Uh, no, Sergeant. If you are a man of business, you would not need to be informed that there are confidential reasons, uh, very harmless in themselves, uh, for many such wants in the profession to which I belong. If the sum offered is not enough, then say how much more in your conscience as a soldier you demand. If you'll excuse me, sir, I'd rather have nothing to do with this. Why not? Because I am not a man of business. And when I get into things of this kind, I have the feeling I'm being smothered. Take care you do no harm by this. <laughs> you are the best judge of your own interest, of course. I think I'll have nothing to do with it. Please yourself, Sergeant. You brimstone beast, I'll twist you, I'll smash you, I'll crumble you, George, I'll powder you, I'll put you out in the gutter, I can do it, I will! Shake me up. Good day to you, sir. You are my client money. I pay the interest monthly, the sum as agreed. The principal loan is 97 pounds. Mr. Smallweed is within his rights to call in that sum at any time. Let him call, sir. I don't have it as well he knows. Does your friend... Uh... Bagnet have it. He went shorty for you. He'd better have it. He gave reference of character. Bagnet is your guarantor, Sergeant. One of you had better have the money if uh, Mr. Smallweed should want to call it in. I'll smash you. Pity you're not a man of business. Is your friend uh, Bagnet a man of business? 
He's a very respectable man. Used to be Royal Artillery. My friend, I don't care a pinch of snuff for the whole of the Royal Artillery. Officers, men, horses, wagons, guns. Does this respectable man have the money? He has a wife and three children. But not 97 pounds. He mustn't be injured on my account. You have the means to prevent that. I can give you a written undertaking that this man, Bagnet, shall never be troubled in any way in the matter of the loan until you have been proceeded against to the utmost. That your means shall be exhausted before my client looks to Bagnet. Well, this, in fact, all but frees him. Aye! All but frees him. This is an exceptional offer, Sergeant. Uh, but it is conditional upon your assisting me in the matter of Captain Horden's handwriting. Make up your mind. I've no more time to waste. You give me no choice. Of course you have a choice, Sergeant. We can still be friends, George. You don't mind me sending the message. I know I shouldn't have done it, but when I saw your little maid in the town, I remembered your goodness to us before, and I didn't know who else I could turn to. It's quite all right, Jenny. I'll help if I can. But Charlie didn't properly understand you. Who is this boy? Where is he now? Oh, Miss, he's that sick. He helped Lizzie and me in London. Showed us her way and where to lodge. It was worse than here. All the boys ever known. I thought we might as well bring him. He took bad on the way. Is he no better, Lizzie? He looks bad. No one will listen. He don't belong. He can't pay. Who's to care? Can he stay here? Your master won't have that, Jenny. He won't have Joe in the state he's in. There's no money to feed another mouth, you know that. And mine will say the same. We thought we'd earned something in London. Joe's all we brought back. More trouble for our men. Of shame by his going in the first place. There'll be blows for this, Jenny. Miss, he's so very sick. Something must be something. Judy, you brimstone sow. Will you stir yourself? All right, I'm coming. Every scrap, you hear me? All right. You found me nothing yet. Get on, your witches, brew of them. All right. 
Must be something. Broomstick chatterer. All right. There be something. Must be something. Crook never threw anything away. Close there was Crook. Cunning. Couldn't read, but he knew better than to throw his fortune away. There be something. Oh, yes. Every square inch, mind that, Judy! Twelve inches to put three foot a yard! What, you black beetle! <laughs> Judy, shake me now. Oh, my poor bones. Oh, dear me. <laughs> oh, my dear Lord. Oh. You had better turn him out. What do you mean? Put him out in the road? My dear John Dice, you know what a child I am. Be cross with me if I deserve it. But you know, I have a constitutional objection to this sort of thing. I always had when I was a medical man. The boy's not safe, you know. There's a very bad sort of fever about him. So what happens to him if I put him out? I haven't the least idea, but he'll be no worse off than he was before. If you wish, make him better off. Give him sixpence or five shillings or a pound. In the meantime, remembering that you were once a medical man, is there any sort of treatment that you can recommend for him? Well, you might tell them to sprinkle a little vinegar about the place where he's sleeping. Otherwise, well, no, I, I'd leave any further detail to Miss Summerson. She doesn't mind these things. I'm afraid I don't have the will for them. Very well. Excuse me, sir. May I talk to you a moment? From the bailiff? No, sir, that's not my office. Don't be afraid. I won't keep you long. This uh, boy that's been brought to the house when better judgment might have prevailed, don't you think, sir? If I was to know exactly where he's been put, I don't want to disturb the family. That's all we have, is it? All he has. He keeps saying, move on, move on. Policeman, Miss Ida. I propose a toast to our young friend. Better health to Joe. I have a poetic notion concerning Joe. Suppose now that fate 
has reserved a place for him in history. I really do fancy that Joe may emulate another ragged urchin thrown on his own devices. Remember Dick Whittington. There. Now I've said it, I'm convinced of it. Joe is to become Lord Mayor of London. Isn't that a happy thought? I can see all manner of most admirable works of charity arising from his gratitude to this household. Lord Mayor Joe will establish the John Dice Institution for Orphans and the Esther Summerson Almshouses. And there will be the City of London Corporation annual pilgrimage to Bleak House. And lemonade and spiced buns consumed in the tent of the Lord. In all sincerity, I'm sure our young friend is an excellent... Excuse me, I must find out. In his way. Lanterns. Charlie, what is it? It's Joe, Miss. He's gone. Well, speak up, child. What's happened? The men are looking for the boy, sir. Joe, sir. He's gone. We've looked everywhere. They're taking the dogs around the fields now. He wasn't fit to move. Although, if delirious, could he get far? How can I say? You must go and help. Will he die, miss? He's gone to meet his destiny. We can't delay him. Man of the future. has been affected with this same illness, it would have shown itself by now. However, we must all remain very watchful 
any sign at all of fever, stomach sickness, a rash on the skin, anything that alarms any of you concerning your health, you must report to me immediately. And Miss Summerson has to be kept on her own. The only person, apart from the doctor, who will enter her room until further notice will be her maid, Charlie, who is with her now. I have to tell you that Miss Summerson is very ill. Her appearance may be changed by it. Well, for a while, certainly, we have to accept she will be changed by it. However, I understand that these marks do not always persist. At any rate, not in the same... The scars will go away. Well, it happens sometimes. An act of charity has been sadly illused. was the boy who brought the infection. I should have sent him to the hospital, insisted they take him in. I have the power to do that because I'm a man of wealth and property and standing. But that child and those poor women who have nothing except their needs, they couldn't make the hospital open its doors. I blame myself. What happened to the boy? Is he dead? Esther, she could also die. Charlie. Please. I am blind, Charlie. Miss. Not really. For good. Not really. Are you expecting a visitor today, Rosa? I don't know, my lady. Don't know? I mean, I'm not sure, my lady. I'm not sure whether what... Whether young Mr. Watt Ranswell will be arriving with his father or not. Yes, my lady. Do you know why Mr. Ranswell Sr.? has asked to speak to Celesta? Partly, my lady. I also know. Partly. Are you in love with him? I don't know, my lady. This house as well as I know my own. Best place any boy ever had to play in hide and seek. Most of it empty half the year. Gotta jump out in the servants doing the cleaning. Find them out of their boots. 
and I'd find a footman and a chambermaid passing the time of day in a place where they'd no right to be. <laughs> and I'd be under a, under a bed or behind a curtain, you know, squeaking like a mouse. <laughs> the girl would be up and away. I never understood why it made the footman so angry. Got my ears boxed once or twice. <laughs> Chesney Wall. One of the noblest houses in the land. Playground. Mother, you're looking grand health. Grand! <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, you young rascal! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do I understand? Is my lady to understand that you consider this young woman too good for this house? and likely to be injured by remaining here. You had better explain what you mean. Willingly, Lady Dedlock. Simply this. Your housekeeper, my mother, has lived here for half a century. And please don't suppose I'm ashamed of her position here. Although I would have much preferred her to retire some years ago and spend the rest of her days with me. But I know it would break her heart to sever the bond she has with this house and this family. I appreciate the attachment there can be between high and low station. But when it comes to talking about my son's future wife, there are other things to consider. In my world, unequal marriages are common enough. The son of a factory owner may tell his father he's fallen in love with one of the girls that works there. The father may say, very well, I shall place this girl for two years in the same school with your sisters. And if, at the end of that time... Mr. Roswell, are you making a parallel between Chesney Wold and a factory? Two very different places, I grant you. But the circumstances are much the same. Are you aware that this young woman was taught at the village school, just outside these gates? I know that, Celeste. And I'm bound to say I don't regard your village school as providing an adequate education for a daughter-in-law of mine. You said you would be candid. Lady Dedlock, we are discussing my son's future. People should not be educated out of their stations. You now you want of that breed? You want to level the nation, do you? Guillotines, the rabble, wild in the streets. Is that what you want? I'm concerned with my son and this pretty girl, Rosa. Celeste feels that his views and yours are, in a general sense, probably strongly opposed. You would be unlikely to agree on whatever you were to discuss. If this young woman wishes to withdraw herself from my lady's notice and favor and place herself under someone else's influence, she is at liberty to do so at any time. What you have said will not, of itself, have any effect on her position here, meanwhile. Celeste, Lady Dedlock, thank you for your attention. You don't want to leave me just yet, do you? No, my lady. Not if you think... I'll do what you say, my lady. Don't be frightened. I want you to be happy. And I will make you happy. If it is in my power to make anyone happy. He loves you. Trust me. Do you 
want to know where I found them? I found them. Quiet! Want to know? Huh? Lady Jane's bed. <laughs> Crook's old cat. The letters were hidden in her box where she sleeps. I knew there'd be something. Hidden, huh? you see, like valuable should be. What's a fair sum? Five hundred? You want them, there's a price! Of course. There's a price for everything. I should like to tell you a story uh, to illustrate the pride of the new men like Mr. Ransford. It's of real flesh and blood. I hope Lady Dedlock won't think me ill-bred. It concerns a townsman of your Mr. Ransford, a man in exactly those circumstances, I'm told. He had the good fortune to have a daughter who attracted the notice of a great lady. I'm speaking of a really great lady. One married to a man of your condition, Celeste. The lady was wealthy and beautiful. And she liked the girl. And she kept her not quite as a servant. And not quite as a pet. But as something of the two. Very close. Now, this lady had a secret. Early in life, she had been engaged to marry a young rake, a captain in the army. She never did marry him, but she gave birth to a child, of which this captain, a man of no reputation, was the father. The captain died in due course and in due disgrace, but that is not of such importance in the story. No. The important part is that the facts were discovered. Owing to some imprudence by the great lady. You can imagine, Lady Dedlock, the domestic turmoil that followed. As you would imagine, Celeste, her husband suffered a torture of grief. And then came the twist of the knife. When this townsman of Mr. Ranswell came to hear these disclosures, he immediately took his daughter away from the great lady. The lady was no longer regarded as acceptable company, as if she were the commonest of commoners. Such is the pride of the new men. I hope Lady Dedlock will excuse the painful nature of this story. Is it true concerning the girl, my attendant Rosa? Do family and friends know my secret? Is it the town talk? No, Lady Dedlock. The girl in my story represents a hypothetical case. It would be a real case if they knew what we know. How long have you known about me? I've known, fully known, for only a few days. 
that I suspected for quite some time. Before you knew anything, I think. I think before you knew, you didn't suspect. You hoped. I'm sure it's true that we never trusted each other. Quite. I always knew you would find out. Of course you would. That is your calling. You hunt out secrets. They give you power over people. They make people fear you. You have a passion for other people's fear. The only passion you'll ever know. What do you want me to do? Sign a confession? Don't expect remorse or repentance. That is not for your ears. There is nothing to be done. If I am to leave, I shall go tonight. What then? What do you want? I haven't yet been able to decide on what course to take, how to act next. For the meantime, I must ask you to keep your secret, as you've kept it for so long. Live with it. And with my husband. On your mercy. At your pleasure. Celeste is my sole consideration. That is to say, he and the family reputation are one. Celeste and the baronetcy. Celeste and Chesney World. Celeste and his ancestry and heritage. All this is my consideration. It's your living. I thought once it would be easier for me to tear up the oldest tree on this estate with my own hands than to break your hold on Celeste or his trust and confidence in you. Now I can break it. But I don't know what the shock of hearing the truth about you might do to him. It might send him out of his wits or put him on his deathbed. I mean, the sudden shock of it. Was that the object of your storytelling tonight? To prepare him? I have to judge whether he can be told. Whether it is in your interest. It might not break him. Or his love for me. Do you fear that? I would remind you, Lady Dedlock, where your past imprudence has brought you. I hope you will do nothing on impulse or by whim. I shall not. You may depend on it. I must wait for your decision. Yes, you must. Hiding my guilt. As you have for so many years. Is your secret any heavier now than it was before? <laughs> 